Okay, so good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Center for Teaching and Learning's uh, Samiksha series of webinars. Uh, our topic today is don't just make a living, make a life. Uh, our guest uh, needs absolutely no introduction. Uh, Mr. Gurcharan Das uh, is a celebrated author, commentator, thought leader, management guru. Uh, he was CEO of Procter & Gamble India and later managing director of Procter & Gamble Worldwide. Uh, he's a celebrated author. Uh, he has uh, you know, several international bestsellers. India Unbound was called a quiet earthquake by The Guardian and has been published in 17 languages and filmed by the BBC. Uh, his last book, India Grows at Night, A Liberal Case for a Strong State, was on FT's uh, list of the best books of 2013. Uh, extremely accomplished. Uh, it's a privilege to have you here, Mr. Das. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, our moderator is my colleague, uh, Professor Dalia Mani from the entrepreneurship area. Uh, Professor Dalia uh, is a prolific uh, researcher and her research, of, research focuses on networks of ownership ties between firms. Um, a great teacher, a great colleague overall. Uh, it's, uh, thank you so much, Dalia, for doing this for us. Uh, so welcome to you. And without further ado, let me hand over the floor to you. So you're handing the floor to me or <laughs> to Dalia? To Dalia. Yeah, no, th thank you, uh, Chetan, for inviting me to do this. It gave me a great opportunity to uh, read uh, Mr. Gurcharanan Das's uh, books. Uh, so let me actually not keep our audience waiting. Mr. Das, uh, please go ahead. We're all looking forward to your talk. <clears throat> uh, Professor Subramaniam called me a management guru. And let me quickly disabuse you of such an entity or such an animal. In my book, such a person is good at understanding, G-U, but relatively useless, R-U. <laughs> of course, the name Guru is also in my name, so this presents a problem. Uh, but it wasn't always so. Until the age of three, my name was Ashok Kumar. And my grandmother suspected that my mother her daughter-in-law had given me that name because she thought my mother was secretly in love with a Bollywood actor named Ashok Kumar. So that wasn't appropriate. And so she took me to a guru and she placed me at his feet. And uh, she told the guru, give this boy a name. And the guru looked down at him, me and he smiled and I looked up at him and I smiled and he says, well, obviously his name should be Guru Charan Das. And so overnight at the age of three, I was transformed from the Prince of Happiness, Ashok Kumar, to Guru Charan Das, the humble servant of the feet of the guru. I think the guru was also <laughs> sending me a message of some kind. And one of the messages was that, uh, that I, I needed to learn humility. And some years later, he explained to me that his concept of humility was basically to take your work seriously and not yourself seriously. And I thought that was really quite uh, a wonderful thing, at least at the later in life when he, 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 he talked about it. Now, <clears throat> I've met many leaders uh, in both my avatars as a business person as well as as a writer. And I found that it had three qualities in common, these leaders. One was not intelligence, but determination. Fierce willpower. The second quality was humility, and I've told you what my guru's idea of humility was. Uh, and the third was integrity. And integrity, you see, never, in, never from somebody who speaks about it. You see it always in action. And so, in fact, you should worry when somebody starts speaking about integrity. I'm 
going to talk to you today about the difference between making a life and making a living. And um, I'm going to tell two stories. The, the, you know, most of us are so caught up in the rat race, grubbing for grades and marks when we are in school, climbing ladders when we are at work, focused on our next promotion. And we forget. We basically sleepwalk through life. We forget the difference between making a living and making a life. Well, I learned about making a living from my mother who suffered from middle-class insecurities all her life. And I learned about making a life from making a living from my mother, making a life from my father. And my earliest memory is when I was in kindergarten in Lahore. This is in 1947. I was four years old, and just before partition. And I came home with sporting a report card. And my mother saw me excited. And she said, did you stand first? And from the back, my mother, my father, who was sitting amused, he usually sat amused at life. He said, that was the wrong question. And he, what he was basically uh, trying to say to my mother was that she should, I should be asking my child, what does he enjoy in school? What, what aspects, what is new? What is he encountering that is new? And essentially encourage the curiosity uh, that a child has. Unfortunately, education kind of kills that curiosity. And I think he was also making another point that um, we are all, we don't all grow up like Mozart. Mozart at the age of three knew that he was a musical genius. And by five, he had written his first symphony. Most of us stumble through life. And, and therefore it's important to live one's li life in an examined sort of way. So I was born in a middle-class Punjabi family and uh, we came as refugees. Actually, we had to flee for our lives a few months later after this incident. And we arrived safely in India, but being a middle-class family, the budget was always tight, and uh, but by some un unbelievable luck, I was, you know, I went through school like everyone else, and my mother never learned her lesson from my father. She kept insisting, did you come first every year? And of course, he kept reminding her that was the wrong question to ask. But anyway, but an unbelievable luck, I got a scholarship to go to Harvard as an undergraduate. In those days, this was <laughs> totally unprecedented for something like that to happen, but it kind of fell out of the sky. And my mother, when I left home, she said, make sure you take something useful. You're going to come back to India and you'll need a job. And, and so she says, why don't you become like your father? My father was an engineer with the government. And he, she says, at least you'll get a job. Anyway, I arrived at Harvard and they told me you are in the wrong school if you want to study engineering. There's another school down the river called MIT. You'll get a better education as an engineer. Anyway, I forgot my mother's advice and I followed my father's advice and I got caught in the romance of the liberal education. And for the next four years, I was studying Greek tragedy, Russian novels, uh, 
French history and I was reading philosophy and Sanskrit. I did Sanskrit, architecture, art, Chinese ceramics. I mean, I was totally in love with the world uh, of thought and ideas and, 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 and useless, what my mother called useless subjects. But I finished a degree in philosophy and I got another scholarship to go to Oxford to do a PhD. So when I went home that summer, um, um, I suddenly asked myself one day, I was lying down in the grass. Our home was in Chandigarh. And I was lying in a park in the grass talking to some friends. And I asked myself, did I want to spend the rest of my life at that stratosphere of abstract thought? No, I decided. And so, um, but what to do? And suddenly my mother found to her horror that she had an unemployed son at home. And we had a neighbor who used to needle her every day, asking, Toda munda ki karya, what is your son doing? And my poor mother, she would get very embarrassed saying that I don't know. And, and so just to appease her and assuage her, I answered the first advertisement in the newspaper I found. It was a company that wanted management trainees, a uh, company that made Vicks Vapor up. Now, I knew nothing about management, but I think they must have got impressed with my Harvard de degree. So they must have taken me. In those days also, we didn't have MBAs. It wasn't very common. So you could study anything you wanted to. And so that's how I began. My mother was very relieved that at least she had a son who was became a salary man. And, 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 and so... I went from the ivy covered halls of Harvard to the dusty bazaars of Trichy and of Coimbatore and of uh, Shimoga and Ratlam and all over with a bag going to visit from chemist shop to chemist shop. And believe it or not, I rather enjoyed that life. Suddenly I was you know, right in the middle, I, I had said I wanted a life of action, not a life of thought alone. But at the same time, you know, there was a, a feeling inside me that I had a side of thought, which I enjoyed. And <clears throat> so I did the second best thing. I started wearing a second hat on the weekend. In other words, I wore my executive management trainee hat Monday to Friday and Saturday and Sunday. I used to read and write and I became actually began to write. And, and so I got a second kind of second career, but more as a hobby. But I took that hobby very seriously because one, I enjoyed it. And two, I found I got better and better at it. And so that's how I got started in a second kind of life. And right from the beginning, I, for 25 years, I wore two hats, hat for the weekday and hat for the weekend. And my father could understand that. He, 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 he understood all this and, uh, and, 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 and so, uh, I enjoyed my work and I did it well. And I rose and I became CEO of the company. That company that made Vicks Vaporub was bought over by Procter & Gamble. And so I was Procter & Gamble and I became CEO of Procter and & Gamble. And, and then I was uh, sent to the world headquarters. They thought I needed some help and to understand the company a little bit more and they made me head of global strategy. And one day I walked into my office and on the radio, I had heard that the, ref this is 93, that the reforms in India had got 
stuck. From 91 to 93, Narsimha Rao and Manmohan Singh, they were doing these reforms and then it got stuck. And I was depressed by that thought because I believed that 91 really was our year of freedom. I mean, we didn't get our freedom in 1947. We got political freedom. But promptly after that, we lost our economic freedom in the license permit Raj. So it was freedom for me. Anyway, I was sitting down at my desk looking at the Nielsen uh, market share figures from around the world. I used to scan that in the morning, my secretary would put them on my desk. And sometimes I just flipped over them just to see what was going on. And, uh, and I asked myself, here's an adult male having worked 25 years and there's a whole world outside in trouble, meaning the reforms in India, the left wing of the Congress party wanted to undo the reforms. The leftists were very strong at that time. And here I was scared of that. And here I'm looking at the market share of Pampers and Tide and VIX and Oil of Olay. I mean, all good products, but what was I doing? It sounded like totally absurd. And that's, I mean, when I came home and was depressed. My, my wife said, oh, you're just having a midlife crisis. It'll go away. But it did not go away. And so I had to sit down with my wife and show her sums, how much money we had and how much expenditure we will have. Fortunately, we had a home to come back to. And so like a good sport, she agreed finally. And uh, I'm, I'm, this is all, I mean, I could go on and on because I'm just finishing an autobiography. And it's really on the whole notion of moksha, which is the fourth goal, having written about the first three. So it will become a quartet of books. You know, Artha, Dharma, Kama, and Moksha, the Purusharthas. Uh, Artha was India unbound. Dharma was the difficulty of being good. Kama, riddle of desire. I mean, this sounds like a commercial, but it's not. The fourth is Moksha, <laughs> and I haven't got a title for the book, but it's about freedom, about getting free, and, 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 uh, and, and I'm not using it in the spiritual, religious sense, but in a secular sense, which was the original meaning in Sanskrit. Anyway, the long and short of it was that from that midlife crisis, I came back, and that's how I became a writer. I came back to defend the reforms, to be a cheerleader for the reforms. There were other things that happened in between, which I won't go into, but that's in, in, in short, the story. And, and also, you know, I mean, the, now let me quickly, before I run out of time, let me quickly tell you the second story. So this is really how one person, in my, in my case, uh, attempted to make a life. Luckily, that what started as a hobby came to my rescue. And I had written already three plays which had been produced, which had been done, uh, which had one been done off Broadway, another one on BBC, and all and had been performed in India. So I had practice and I wrote a novel in my 30s and the novel also is still in print. It's uh, called A Fine Family. And, uh, and in fact, it's coming on Netflix. They are going to make a film out of it soon. So I had perfected, taken writing seriously and improved with every book and, and so on. And so it was, it had the, con I had the confidence to quit, you see. So that was one way of making a life. Now I'll totally, I'll turn you to a, another story, which is actually much more interesting. And that is the story of a young man who came to work in our company as a assistant security guard to work on the night shift. He came from a village in Maharashtra, from Akola district, and he didn't know much English. 
he wasn't a graduate obviously he had he was metric pass and but he was very special you knew from the day he arrived he loved the office every gadget he had never seen so he saw the coffee maker and he saw how it worked so he learned the coffee machine the first day and then he went around on his rounds security rounds offering coffee and tea to everybody the next day he saw the telex machine now he didn't know english but he was fascinated and you know he started it was he was a night guard so during the daytime he started taking english classes and within a month or so he was sending telex messages then he discovered the switchboard so after our hours even though he don't know much english he started operating the switchboard and so there he was actually just with that kind of childish curiosity you know how a child is um if it's raining adults there's a there's a puddle on the in the on the road the all the adults will go around the, they'll carry an umbrella and go around the puddle what will a child do he'll go jump into the puddle to see how it feels like well that was this guy called kamble that was his name kamble in fact he was such a dehati that he would pronounce the company's name proctor and gamble <laughs> and so you know he had within 3 months he had made himself indispensable if you needed anything in the evening shift you asked said ask kamle once i needed to get in touch with our finance director nobody knew where he was so ask kamle kamle sure enough made a couple of calls and he knew he was in delhi staying at a shoka hotel he connected me in 5 minutes i was speaking to him so this was kamle and one day you know somebody dropped i mean somebody dropped a wallet which contained a lot of money in 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 the outside the men's room it was found kamle found it and he came to me he says there's a hell of a lot of money in this wallet and what are we going to do and so he checked the found out that there was an id card it belonged to a senior manager so he told me now you become the assistant security guard for the night shift for one hour i'll go to bandra and i'll go and deliver this money but don't tell anyone and so he arrived and nobody could have been happier because this was the down payment for a flat and the manager had taken this money out from the bank in order and the i mean the seller was arriving in half an hour so kamle saved the day but again he swore the man to secrecy and he said you know i found this here it is and after he came back after about uh, working for 7 8 months we had a our telephone operator during the day time decided to go on maternity leave she was having a baby so kamle went to the head of personnel and he said look i'm tired of working at night so give me a chance i'll be your temporary telephone operator until she comes back but the head of personnel said kamle you we get called we are a multinational company we get calls from around the world and you can't even pronounce the name of the company how can you be a telephone operator so poor kamle went away with a long face and i heard from the grapevine about this so i went to the personnel because he had made a, such a reputation <laughs> in the evening shift everybody said ask kamle and uh so i went to personnel and i said let's give him a try for a couple of days have a backup ready and if this guy doesn't work out we we'll, uh, you know go with the backup anyway uh so i see kamle sitting down and enjoying himself i arrived in the office and there he was in the in those days you know you had to pull the push those wires into the the switchboard and that's how you connected people 
just as we had to send telexes in those days. Anyway, so there he is. Uh, and I got a, got a call the next morning from our lawyer uh, who says, Mr. Das, have you got a new EPBX system? I said, no. He says, well, your calls are ans answered promptly on the second ring. I used to have to wait fifth ring, sixth ring, you know, before. So I thought maybe you've had a new system. Anyway, that evening I was going home and I stopped by the te telephone operator's booth and I asked Kamle, why do you answer the phone so quickly? And he said, well, there may be a customer at the other end with an order and I don't want to lose it to a competitor. I mean, it was a dynamite answer. And uh, I mean, even the finance the marketing director couldn't have given such an answer. But there he was, Kamle. He was the next day. He was giving advice to a mother in Marathi whose child had got wet in the rain and had developed a cold. And so he was at the agony aunt telling her to put the spoonful of Vicks in the hot water and take the bath, the steam from it. And this is how Kamle. Uh, life was and and really uh, he brought a certain energy which infected everybody he had a instinctive desire for service the long and short of it is that this guy couldn't be stopped he was already taking English lessons so English was better but he was, what he infected the office with was a degree of fun. He enjoyed working. I mean, I think he would have paid us to let him come to work, that kind of person. And, and so also, because he, one day he brought a carom board and suddenly at lunchtime, they're playing carom. And then the other day, another, uh, others saw him so other people brought carom board. So lunchtime became carom board time. So this is the kind of thing that uh, this person was. So let me take a couple of minutes because I want to tell you, I mean, I just want to tell you that he, uh, I said he couldn't be stopped. Well, the company quickly realized that they had somebody special here and they got kept getting promoted. He, they promoted him to the next job. He got a permanent job. He became permanent security. Then from security, he became personnel assistant manager. And then he moved on administration manager. Finally, he became a director of the company. Now, I want to take a few minutes to analyze what it was that made him special. So one was that quality I talked about, determination willpower that hungry he was uh, from a village he was hungry and also i mentioned three qualities in the beginning uh, of success of a leader and i didn't mention intelligence in any of those do you remember well that's what i meant. i think he what he taught me was that attitude actually is more important than skills or intelligence you can learn skills at the job, but attitude, you can't. The other thing I learned from him was he had a bias for action. The, if you remember, I said, if you needed anything, he got it done. And uh, the, he also, also made me realize that actually execution is even more important than strategy. We value strategy a lot. I was head of global strategy for PNG. But what here was significant was the fact that, I mean, a lot of companies can have good strategy, but not everyone can have um, the kind of executional skills that are really required for success. Um, the other quality in him uh, was a fundamental empathy and his desire if you needed anything you could you could ask him and he would really try and do it for you 
get it for you, whatever. It, it's like the, you know, I, a few years ago, I, uh, I, my, it was my wife's birthday. I went to a sari shop in Lajpat Nagar market here. And uh, the sari wala started showing me saris. And he brought out each thorn from up there and brought it down and opened the sari. And before he, I knew it, he had shown me 40 and I was totally confused. And I ended up buying three. So smart on his part. But I also realized that he'd have to put all 40, refold them, refold them, and put them back up on the shelf. So this is the kind of service orientation which really is, you, you know, there are only three ways to gain competitive advantage. You can either gain competitive advantage through superior products, which means investing hell of a lot in technology. You can get gain advantage through lower prices, but you know that the, if you cut your price, that drops down to the bottom line. And the third is service. Now, service is free. So just hire Kamblaze in your company. You get it free. And in fact, today, in, there are not that much differences in technologies. And the com companies catch up very quickly with a new technology. Your competitors do. You know that. Uh, so it's not. But service can be more enduring if you have the right people. And, and so I just to complete the story that after two months after that Saudi incident, uh, uh, I had to go to London to attend a board meeting. And over lunch, I dropped, uh, I was wearing a white shirt, not a blue one like this one. Uh, and I dropped something on my shirt. And after lunch, we were meeting the largest customer of our company. And so I ran to Bond Street to get a new white shirt. And uh, I asked the woman for, sh to show me some shirts in the, uh, in the store. And the girl showed me three. And I remembered the sariwala. I said, show me some more. And she said, first, will you buy one of these? I told her whoever had trained her had really done a terrible job. Because uh, she was every time she opened her mouth, she was losing a customer. Anyway, my point is it doesn't come instinctively, the notion of service. And so I suggest to you that for hiring new people, we all make the mistake in companies. We interview people, we keep asking them about what they know, what skills they have. Obviously, if they have come at, if they're the top of the class in IIM Bangalore, they know their stuff. So what are we doing wasting their time and our time? What you need to do is find out about attitude in those interviews. And it is really attitude rather than uh, skills that really make the difference and create great leaders. The other quick thing about Kamle, remember that incident with the wallet I told you? Now that was integrity in action. There was a lot of money in that wallet. And uh, the more interesting thing is not that he was honest. More interesting thing is he didn't want others to know. And so he, all his life was defined by that self-effacing quality of, 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 of not, of, of take, of acting without caring who got the credit. And, that, and that's another word for the lesson that Krishna taught Arjuna in chapter two and chapter three of the Gita which is nishkam karma or nishphala karma. And, 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 and he was truly a karma yogi in that sense. Anyway, uh, I could go on with the list. I've run, I think I'm running out of my time. We are, oh God, I think I've run over my time. It's time for the Q&A. 
But let me just end by telling you that this guy uh, made his life at work because he loved arriving at the work each morning. And if you ask me, my definition of happiness is to love the work you do and love the person you live with. Now, I've talked about loving the work you do. If you want to learn about loving the person you live with, then here's a commercial message. You have to read my new book called Karma, the Riddle of Desires. And that's all about loving the person you live with. The commercial message is over. And now I think we can uh, move on uh, uh, move on to the Q&A. Just quickly to, to wrap up the notion of making a life. I think one way you know that you are loving your work is that time gets distorted at work. Meaning you suddenly uh, look at your watch and it's seven o'clock. And you realize, oh my God, I thought it was five o'clock. You've lost two hours. That means you had lost yourself. You would forgotten yourself. That's one way to know that you are, you're enjoying what you're doing. The other thing is that, in fact, a lot of people don't like their work. They don't admit it. I mean, they, they're earning big salaries. And who wants to, you know, bitch about the work? But they don't really. I mean, that's why, thank God, it's Friday. The restaurant chain is so successful. And, 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 and so I think that the quality that I find, that I learned from Kamle, was this quality of living lightly, not carrying the burden of the world. You know, there's a wonderful word, uh, the, Patanjali has uh, in his Yoga Sutras, talks about Lakhima. Lakhima is a Sanskrit word, which means lightness. It's one of the siddhis, one of the perfections. And what I saw in Kamle was a person who lived lightly. Not like a feather, but like a bird. A bird has agency. So let me leave it at that. We've talked and I've talked enough. Now I think uh, we will have Professor Dalia Mani is going to throw some questions at me. Mr. Das, that was really interesting. The stories were so interesting. And um, there are many in our audience who want to ask questions, who have already asked questions. Uh, so let me try and pose these questions to you. Um, let me start with the, with the story and the anecdote that you started your talk with um, about how you had a 30-year, very successful career, moving up the corporate ladder, raising a family. Um, and, you know, in every way, a very exemplary, successful life. And then one day you ask yourself, how long could an adult be expected to be motivated by a 0.5% gain in the monthly market share of Vix, Vaporub or Pop? Pampers. <laughs> uh, the, this question is really pure and brilliant in its spirit. And, uh, you know, I think it made many of us who read this question laugh out loud, uh, because I think it has occurred to many of us, but we didn't have the guts to maybe ask it. Um, we want to understand what was your, we're curious, what, how did you answer this question? Um, and especially, uh, you mentioned Dharma, the Mahabharata, your investigations into these uh, spiritual texts. Um, and we want to know from you, uh, as students or managers, uh, what do you think our dharma is? Um, and I, I know you clarified that you're talking from a secular spiritual sense uh, rather than a religious sense. So it applies to all of us here. Um, and how do you reconcile this notion uh, with ideas about following our dreams, discovering our passion? Uh, do you believe that these are contradictory no notions? And if not, why? 
Oh gosh, that's not one question. That's four questions. But very quickly, uh, given the fact that we our time is limited, I'll quickly say that I, you know, the answer I came gave up in, in 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 to your first question was what did I answer to myself? Well, it it was not a painful. I mean, it was a painful experience. It was a true midlife crisis. In fact. In my current book that I'm writing, which is about another sort of moksha, uh, and it's autobiographical, I, I I discuss exactly how I came to. In my case, I quit my job, but I was able to quit it because for 25 years I had a second life. And I could fall back on that second life, and I think many people come are in my position, where when you reach fifty, I was fifty years old when I quit, and you've you've uh, um, this thing comes up, you know, you you really question what you want, and so uh, so I guess I've answered that question. The second question about as students, managers, what is our dharma? I believe it is dharma is in a sense to do the best you can do and excel it, excel at it. Uh, and there's no reason why following your dream would be against dharma, uh, because. As you follow your dream, you excel at doing what you do best, and that could lead you to do something better or even different from what you're doing. Um, you know, it's not, uh, but of course, it's re has you have to be realistic about it, and you don't want to, um, you don't want to. Uh, do it for the wrong reasons. In other words, I think I'm go I'm going to tell you a, a, a sort of a naughty little story. Uh, you don't want to be like Rajat Gupta. Rajat Gupta, as you know, reached the top of McKinsey, and then he retired. And then he his friends he he was worth oh only 150 million dollars. Poor guy. But he was friends were billionaires. I mean, they're the people who he had advised over life. And he felt poor amongst billionaires. And so he got involved in, anyway, into a scandal which involved insider trading. And, but the point here is that he all his life had lived a very respected life of a counselor, of a manager. A manager is a kshatriya, a counselor is a kshatriya to a man of capital, to a vaisha or a banya. Rajat Gupta suddenly switched his role from being a very respected high, high kshatriya to somebody who wanted to be a vaisha. And so there you go. You don't want to confuse and you don't want to do it for the wrong things for the wrong reason. Anyway, uh, your third question, what exactly should we do? I, I don't know whether you asked this question, but I think about what should we do when we are trying to be, to be good? I, did you ask that? Or you, were, you sent me that question earlier. So let's, let's go back to your question. I think, I hope I've answered your question reasonably yes, briefly. Please. Yes, Mr. Das, very briefly and very clearly. Um, that actually brings us uh, to the next question, which, uh, you know, interestingly is also popping up in our chat uh, because it seems to be a question that everybody is concerned with, uh, which is what exactly should we do when we are trying to be good? good in the world? Right. Uh, well, and you know, the, the, the thing is, yeah, continue. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was done. Please go ahead. No, so what I was saying is that you see in... Uh, in the ancient uh, tradition that we belong to, uh, you don't have, we didn't have 10 commandments. And so dharma is something we were supposed to figure out for ourselves. And it, and it required, it required, sorry, my eyes are 
slightly. Okay, something has got. Okay, I'm fine. So, so you know, uh, the fact is that there we face daily uh, what we call dharma sankats dilemmas. I mean, there's a famous story in the Mahabharata about Rishi Koshak, who is in a town square, and he is known as an honest man. And he's very proud that he was an honest man, always told the truth. And he sees this fellow running and four guys running behind him, after him. And, and so they ask him, where did that guy go? He has been witness to that person going. And so he's honest. And so he gives them. He went that way, not that way. And then they are... And he knows this, that this man had witnessed the crime of these four people and they were, they were going to kill him because he was witness. He knew that. Anyway, he, after his life, exemplary life, he lands up in hell and he asks, what the hell am I doing in hell? Um, and he's told that day you had that man killed. Your duty was not to tell the truth. Your duty was to protect a life. So this is the kind, I mean, this is the problem during the day, during the, our day-to-day -day lives. It's like that story about, you know, that came in the Times of India um, about this child who was drowning in Goa and a young man jumped into the sea and saved this child. And the reporter from the Times of India, she asked him, well, you're a hero. Why did you do it? And he says, oh, I was trying to impress a girl in our college party. We are part of a college group, a holiday group. And she says, well, then you're not a hero. But the fact is he would saved the child. Of course he was a hero. So in, in, when you judge an action, when you judge an action, do you judge it for its consequences or do you judge it by the motivation of the person? And in public actions, normally, you judge it by the consequences. And, 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 and so, uh, I mean, of course, there are people like Yudhishthir who would have jumped in even if nobody was looking. But nevertheless, these are the kinds of dharma sankats that we are talking about. Great. Thank you, Mr. Das. Um, so now uh, I'm going to ask a different question. Um, one of the questions Ria has uh, raised in uh, chat is similar to the question sent to you beforehand, uh, which is about your thoughts on envy. And let me add Ria's questions to that, uh, which is your thought on pride. Um, what are the roles that these play? And also, I want to ask, how do you connect these micro emotions to macro societal issues? So, for instance, you say in your book, if greed is the sin of capitalism, envy is the wise of socialism. Uh, could, you, could you explain to us how you think about these emotions, pride and envy, and also how do you connect these to larger societal issues? Right. Well, let's stay with the, for a minute with envy. Uh, envy, I think, is one of the worst things that human beings suffer from. I mean, uh, jealousy is okay. The difference between envy and jealousy is this, that jealousy is my fear that my friend will run away with my wife. Then I get jealous. And so that's a very legitimate kind of thing. But envy is my inability to stand the success of my friend. That's really a bad thing. And so... Uh, I think that the, when I said that if greed is the sin of capitalism, envy is the vice of socialism. Now, you know, capitalism is reviled all the time as the, as the ideology of greed. But in fact, it's not. The, it's, it's, it's what Adam Smith talked about was self-interested individuals. Now, look, if, you, if it's raining outside, you carry an umbrella like an adult. Of course, if you're a child, you'll go and jump in the puddle. But you'll carry an umbrella. There's nothing greedy about that. You're just self-interested. 
Greed is when it goes overboard, when you're selfish. So self-interested is the ideology of, of it's not greed, but because selfishness is where you actually are stepping over somebody, you're crossing the line, and you could be guilty of breaking the law as well. So I just wanted to make that clear about capitalism. As far as socialism is concerned, well, the reality is that the ordinary person, look, I don't care how much Mukesh Ambani is earning, really, it doesn't enter my head. Or if I was in England, I wouldn't care what the Queen of Eng Engl England is, uh, you know, has. So I believe that all of us care about our neighbors, our friends, our relatives, and we are, so that kind of constant talk about envy related to uh, inequality is a problem, I find. Now, in socialism, there's a wonderful story during the during mid 20s by a Russian writer during the Soviet period. You know, in, in Russia, everybody had the same standard of living. So you, uh, you know, everybody had the same kind of home. And so these women would get together uh, as neighbors. And one day, one of the women received a present from abroad of a tablecloth, beautiful tablecloth. And the other women, because everybody was equal, when they saw this little bit of inequality, they practically killed her for that. And it should beautifully portray this story, uh, how this feeling of envy came about. Now, if there are differences every day, as in the capitalist world, you can shop there, you get this thing, you can that thing. But if in Russia, you only could get one kind of tablecloth and was always the same color, you see? So it's great. Anyway, I could go on, but I think our time is limited. And let me just leave it at that to tell you that yes, the problem with socialism is envy. And that's one of the problems why socialism does not really work. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Das. Uh, let me ask another question about ideology. Um, in your, uh, you talk, you've talked about in your book and in your writings before about how the Mahabharata is suspicious of ideology. It rejects the idealistic pacifist position of Yudhishthira as well as Duryodhana's amoral view. Its own vision and position veers towards pragmatism. Uh, let me ask you uh, your opinion on this. If this principle of pragmatism was applied widely by our leaders, our corporate leaders, our political leaders, our spiritual leaders, then how do you think, in your opinion, how would that change the way things operate? Well, you know, it is the, uh, the pragmatism uh, is essentially uh, from a national perspective of a national leader. It's essentially pursuit of national self-interest. In other words, this was the criticism that people had of Mr. Nehru. Mr. Nehru was a wonderful man, but he injected morality into politics. And he's like he was supporting China for, for a long time at the expense of India. And, and people was, would say, in, Americans asked Kissinger, raised this question, uh, why is Mr. Nehru supporting China? What is the benefit of that to India's national interest? And he, what Kissinger was implying was that when you inject morality into politics, you upset the balance of power because you become, if every nation knows that every nation is pursuing national self-interest, there's a predictability to the international order. But if you inject something like this, anyway, and, and unfortunately in case of Mr. Nehru, China attacked India 
and and it blew this whole idea and 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 and, and mr nehru himself had to uh rethink this but my point is that it's the difference between yudhishthira in the early period when he says he he knows that the the dice game was rigged and dropdi tells him to go and raise an army and get back our kingdom because it was, it was unfairly won f- stolen from us and he says but i've given my word we are going to the for 13 years we're going into exile and she says you accept the give given a word to a man who doesn't respect your word anyway you know the ryodhan did not respect the word and did not give back his share of the kingdom and so there was a war and after that yudhishthira had learned the lesson and that's the mahabharat's point of view a leader cannot be like that early yudhishthira he has to be prudent and pragmatic and pursue the interest of the state and 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 it doesn't mean that you become a moral like duryodhan was but the notion in in human terms is the notion of reciprocal altruism i don't know if you've come across that idea uh that idea is if you smile at the world the world smiles back at you but don't turn the other cheek if the other guy is a crook in other words then it's tit for tat because you have to draw a boundary and that's prudence so it does it's it basically uh saying that you be good that's your default position but don't let yourself be exploited i think that's what i'm talking about the principle of pragmatism uh that uh leaders can't afford to seek moral perfection nor should they be like duryodhan who follow the morality of the stronger that's wonderful thank you mr das um and thank you also i must tell our audience that mr gras uh, mr das has very graciously given us 10 more minutes of his time so we have another 10 minutes that we can ask questions um and i can see the chat just blowing up with lots of questions uh, so let me pick one which has kept coming up many many times um and this question is about uh, the role of money position status and this belief that this is what equals happiness this is what we are told and this is what we are taught to strive for um so the question is how do we break this myth um and especially for the next generation and as teachers and uh, educators how do we break this myth process and for the next generation well i think uh, i've given you two uh, examples two stories uh and in a way both stories are illustrating this point that you have raised and <clears throat> if one pauses stops still sleepwalking uh and lives an examined life now the role of children of parents and teachers is exactly to do the kind of thing that my father used to keep reminding me about making a life to seek a passion for the for his kids and to tell stories frankly i mean i've been telling stories all this time in this session and the best way to teach is and we have india is the oldest storytelling culture in the world so there are lots of stories about everything and uh, and there's a story i read the other day there was a there's a there was a man in manhattan a very guy who made a lot of money he bought this great penthouse on the 52nd floor in this building in manhattan and before it was in in a few days he was looking for a window and he jumped out from the 52nd floor so money <laughs> power status these are the kinds of stories that that uh, you know need to be told 
Yes, very true. Very true, Mr. Das. Uh, let me ask another question, which has come up at least four times in the chat as I look at it. Uh, so let me raise this question. Um, how do you identify and recruit people like Kamle into your organization? How do you know? Um, how, do, how can you recognize passion? Um, that's a very good question. And I don't. the answer is I don't know. <laughs> the, we were lucky to get Kamle. But I have always told my uh, HR people that there should be a way to... So first of all, you don't ask a person during interview what the person knows. You then ask the person to talk about how he did things or what was the story one day when he faced some adversity. Not what he did, but how he did it which is what brings out the attitude of the person. So I'm sure there are now psychological tests also, which can help. But the <clears throat> focus of the interview, I know only one company that looks for this, Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs, you are at the top of the class at IIM Bangalore. You have to go through 25 interviews in Goldman Sachs. I asked the, the, the head of Goldman Sachs one day, he invited me to give a talk. And uh, I said, why 25 interviews? He says, we're looking for attitude. And you know what partner time costs, one and a half hours, the minimum interview is one and a half hours. So, and they're partner interviews. So they really are looking for attitude. And I think if you, I'm sure there are ways and, uh, to do it, but avoid asking the person what the person knows, more about how the person does, he or she does something. Yes, thank you, Mr. Das. Uh, let me ask uh, one more question. Um, and I think at least two people have asked this question. And it's about the value of empathy. And how do you balance being empathetic with your professional role? Well, you know, <clears throat> the highest wisdom in the Mahabharat is at the end when Yudhishthira is walking to heaven and a stray dog attaches itself to him. And they both walk towards heaven and they arrive at the gates of heaven and out comes the heaven keeper and, <clears throat> and he welcomes Yudhishthira inside heaven. And Yudhishthira uh, says, instead of walking in like a sensible person, he says, uh, but what about this dog? And uh, the heaven keeper is, is Indra. And in, he gets, he's really foxed. What nobody's ever asked this question. He says, what? He's not even your dog. He's just a dirty street dog who attached himself to you. And... Uh, no, Yudhishthira says, uh, <clears throat> you don't realize. I mean, he, he thinks that, what is this great God, Indra? He, doesn't he realize we are not on earth? Who will look after this dog? Uh, um, and, and, and so he refuses to go into heaven. And so, of course, it was a test and the, uh, the, 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 the God transforms itself into dharma and all that sort of story. But the main point here is, <clears throat> that <clears throat> caring, empathy, you asked, compassion, is the central moral quality. If one can be aware, I mean, to me, that's the highest. <clears throat> At some point, Mahabharata says the highest dharma is ahimsa. But then it really goes further and says it's anri shamsya. And anri shamsya is the Sanskrit word for compassion for empathy. And, and, and really, uh, he didn't, Yudhishthira didn't restrict it to your friends or neighbors. It was to a dog. So uh, that's really the ultimate dharma. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Mr. Das. 
Uh, let me now end. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time. I know you said you had to uh, be somewhere. So let me end with two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, if I'm getting my uh, count right, I'm scrolling through the chat and I think this has come up three times before. Uh, so let me ask this question. How can we balance the work and personal life? Without money, how can we balance life with a positive attitude? Um, so this has come up several times. How can we balance money with personal life and with happiness? Right. And, <clears throat> you know, I think this whole talk has been a little bit about that. Uh, <clears throat> and I've given you two ways, two person's stories and, and, and how... Uh, in, in, in my case, the work balance came about because I had <clears throat> another life at, during the weekends. And uh, the Kamli got just such a kick out of being at the job that he was uh, walking two centimeters above the ground like Yudhishthira's chariot, you know, right through the day at work. <clears throat> and I, I, I think that if you have that basic sense, even at work, first of all, I'm not saying, I mean, making a living is very important. So Ma Maslow's hierarchy, you know, you have to satisfy. <clears throat> and and um, um, I would say that all of us do need uh, uh, to 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 work uh, unless of course you are so wealthy then you may not need to work but even those wealthy people realize the importance of of working uh, so the the critical thing here the in terms of balance dharma also by the way means balance uh, living sort of a balanced life and that's why the <clears throat> The classical Indian ideal was not uh, this sort of spiritual renunciation. The idea of living in the world was highly valued. And to be karma yogi, the way uh, Kamli was, uh, to live lightly, to take your work seriously, but not yourself seriously. So that, I think, that expression, to take your work seriously, but not yourself. If you don't take yourself seriously, you'll automatically have these qualities that will create, help you navigate to a right kind of balance. You know, dividing time between all sorts of things. Because you're not carrying the burden of the world. You know, live light. So that's my mantra. Live lightly. Like, not like a feather, but like a bird. And, 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 and take your work seriously, not yourself seriously. And, and, and I think this is a way to really, uh, uh, this is a way to um, <laughs> balance the way to happiness. Uh, and at least that's what I have I have learned. Yes, thank you, uh, Ms. Das. Uh, that was very helpful and useful, and we will remember that to take our work seriously, but not ourselves. Uh, now, I should hand it over back to Professor Chetan Subramaniam to uh, wrap things up. We are almost out of time. Yeah. No, no, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Das and uh, Professor Dalia. That was an absolutely riveting session. You know, many life's important lessons I think we learned. Uh, and I thank the audience for some wonderful questions. Uh, just to remind the audience that we'll be back on January 17th on the session on mental health and well-being. Thanks again, Mr. Das. Uh, absolute privilege. And I think we all enjoyed this. Thanks a lot, Dali. Good night. Thank you. Good night.